Thank you very much indeed for that. So, first of all, I'm delighted to be here talking to Rue Callender. Um, Rue, The Guardian describe you as Britain's best-known eco-friendly funeral director, but I'm aware you don't use that term to talk about yourself. So, what is a radical undertaker? Um, a radical undertaker? Well, I mean, just to reference that Guardian thing, uh, I've chosen a profession in, w in which it's quite easy to stand out. You know, I haven't gone for, uh, I haven't tried to be the world's coolest pop star. I've just kind of gone to, to occupy quite a straight area and become radical. But um, I suppose what, I use the term undertaker because I don't like the, the term funeral director because it's too um, patriarchal. It's, 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 it's just too, there's, there's too much control involved in it. And I think what I mean by radical is I mean and I, I'm sure it chimes with a lot of people here, it's about not seeking permission. It's not asking permission before you do something. It's doing it, and if necessary, uh, asking forgiveness afterwards. Um, but really, it's just about kind of uh, taking back control from what has become a very, a very a male, masonic, uh, establishment, um, controlling system, really. Uh, and, and just trying to take away all those uh, those signifiers of control and, and the faux Victoriana uh, and just kind of strip it back to something a lot more earthy. Okay. So proceed until apprehended, yeah? Proceed until apprehended, absolutely, yes. Marvellous. Yeah. And it also it means, uh, it means I have no training, um, I have no licence. I discovered that... Uh, you don't need to use a funeral director. If, if one, one of your next of kin dies and you have the nerve and you have the front and you've read a few books about it, you can take control of it. The family, the next of kin are the funeral director, really. Um, so once you discover that you don't need a funeral director, you then kind of work out that you don't need permission to become a funeral director. Yeah. Uh, so I just set up. I, I've, I've, I, the first uh, dead body I touched was at my first funeral. Um, I, just, uh, I just thought, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to go for it. That's an extraordinary start in what's quite a closed industry, actually. So I gather that um, one of my first things that I got involved in the, in the death trade um, was I had the natural funeral handbook many years ago and got very upset that my now ex-husband wouldn't build me a coffin from the plans that were in there. Yes. And I gather you had that book and that was, or you were I involved did. Well, with it, that. Yeah, the, um, the Natural Death Handbook, it, it was actually seeing the guy, Nicholas Albury, mm -hmm. uh, who died uh, 21 years ago yesterday, right. uh, who set up the Natural Death Centre. He, he, he basically wanted to try and mirror what was happening with birth. He saw the way that birth had been demedicalized. Uh, and uh, home births had become a thing, and he just didn't really didn't see why there wasn't the same thing for death, why death was still very much in the in the grip of the medical uh, establishment. So yeah, it was it was seeing him on telly. Um, literally, I saw him for five minutes. It was when do you remember when Janet Street Porter was head of the Ramblers? I do. Yes. She, she had a program. <laughs> she had an early evening program um, in which she go for a walk and talk to very interesting people, and she talked to this guy for five minutes, and he was talking about different ways of doing funerals, uh, about how you didn't need to bury people in churchyards and uh, you didn't need a funeral director, all of this stuff. And it was just a, a, a light bulb moment. And I was 29, I'd had a lot of bereavement, I'd been to a lot of crap funerals. Yeah. And I just suddenly realized that um, that's what I was gonna do. It was my vocation just landed fully fledged. But yeah, it was the Natural Death Center. And, and I then became a, a trustee of the Natural Death Center about 10 years later. Fantastic. And, th and they Thank come you. from a really, you know, the Natural Death Centre came from the counterculture, came from that uh, very much this, this kind of culture where it's sort of peer-to-peer -peer, um, training and yeah. you don't have to go to the authorities to find out how to do stuff. Yeah. You just meet someone who's clever who will tell you how to do stuff. You know, it's, and work it out as you go along. work it out as you go along and, and space to make mistakes. So who were the, the first people that trusted you to... You're self-taught. You're not in an established family of funeral directors. You're not a name that people know. Who trusted you with their f 
with their family with the, the uh, first I ceremony. Mean, I know, I know. Uh, and so the word trust is what happens. In, and really, every, I'm, I'm still so humbled that people do trust me still. Uh, I did. I did some stuff. I did. I talked a lot in the local press. Um, I did a thing. I had a picture of me with the Oxford Book of Death under my arm, leaning against a tree. Uh, and then I did something on BBC Radio Cornwall because that's where I was living at the time. And I did it at six thirty in the morning, which is for local BBC local radio. That's peak listening hours because basically the demographic is elderly people who don't sleep. Um, and I had, a, I had a call within 10 minutes of doing it of someone going, can you do a funeral? And I was very transparent. I had no, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't, I try not to wear my anarchist badge necessarily when I meet a family, but I don't dress differently. I don't wear suits or anything like that. I don't, uh, I didn't have a fancy car. I still don't have a fancy car, just used an estate car, Volvo. So I was just very transparent with people. Uh, I, I would say to them and go, look, I'm not about stuff. I'm not about selling you a coffin. Yeah. I'm not about a shiny car. I'm not about the flowers. I'm about the experience and I'm about the content. And it's, it's just me, so we will be doing it together. Yeah. And if you're up for that, let's do it. But if you're not, I t it's totally fine. There's millions in yellow pages who you can, you know, yeah. who will steer you through something. And it just struck a chord with, with people. I mean, it took a while before people built. And I also didn't realize that it was a, an almost impossible industry to set up in, you know. As you know, you can't just put a sign on a shop front and go funeral directors and expect people to come in. It's yeah. reputation based. Very much so. So I had to kind of build it slowly. And I just didn't know that you couldn't do that really <laughs> before, it, before it was too late and I was doing it. Well, that's brilliant, Ruth. Thank you. Um, so I've seen many references to rave and punk as having shaped your world. How have they influenced your work and the approach that you take? Oh, m massively. Um, I was 18 in 1988, uh, in the, the second summer of love, uh, and I had just got out of a um, serving a 10-year stretch for a crime I did not commit in a boarding school uh, from the age of seven. Yeah. Um, and raving uh, completely saved me, it completely deprogrammed me from that kind of hardcore uh, establishment schooling. Um, it just, sh it, it, it popped me out into society and showed me that the, that the world was, so, as I suspected and as I knew, but it just proved to me that the world was filled with many, many more people yeah. than the kind of Boris Johnsons of this world. Um, and it showed me a wonderful uh, self-regulating culture, which was um, based about unbridled joy, really. And I think, you know, you remember what it was like in the, in the 80s. Yeah. We, Thatcher had sat on us for just what seemed like forever. Yeah. And there was very little hope and very little joy. And Rave was this thing like um, Snoopy dancing on top of his doghouse. Uh, for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> um, and it, ju it just gave me, it just showed me what community and, and showed me how good people were. And, and I can't deny that, um, that the drugs that were involved at that stage also had a very personal healing experience on me. I'm not, I'm not really in endorsing them for everybody, but for me, and certainly in medical trials now for, for PTSD and things like that, they're, they're proving very, very useful. So. Uh, rave gave me an enor enormous sense of belonging and punk uh, punk is DIY culture really isn't it this, this is, is incredibly punk very much so. so so just the idea of going yeah we don't have to do it like that you know we don't have to do what has been done we can do it our way yeah. and, the, and punk hadn't happened to funerals really up until that point no not at all not at all Okay, so um, you've written a book, which we will have, touch on. Yeah. Um, talk to me about crop circles. Talk uh, to us about crop circles. Crop circles, okay. Um, now, I, I, if I've missed, I haven't been to EMF before, but I don't think I'm misjudging the mood to, to think that uh, this is a very, very clever, sophisticated, science-based audience, so people won't They like be, to think they are. They like to think... 
But I don't, I don't imagine I'm, gonna, I'm on too controversial ground if I, go, if I point out that crop circles are made by people. They're, that's, you know, I come from Totnes. I, could, I would get lynched for saying that. Um, so, so crop circles happened to me at a time when, uh, when my mum died when I was 25 and I was flailing around. Uh, and the crop circle phenomenon was in full swing then. And I got really into them, and I wanted to believe that they were something unbelievably otherworldly. Uh, and they, they did, I had extraordinary experiences in them. But I, I gradually started to work out that really they were people, even though they were these amazing, complex things that were seemingly happening overnight. Um, and, and for me, what they were was, uh, someone's described them as temporary temples. Uh, and people were having incredible experiences in them, but, uh, and they were having what, what they thought were metaphysical experiences or transcendental experiences, but really what they were doing is they were having an emotional response to a work of art, but because they didn't know it was art, it, they were feeling it in different ways. So uh, for me, it was, um, it was a ritual game changer because really really odd things did happen to me in them uh, and i did see people going through sort of spontaneous healings of this and that but it was but i i, I knew it was people making them so crop circle and then i started making them in a very low-key simple way for my own ritual uh, use but um they, they just showed me that you can create something incredibly transcendent and magical genuinely magical that doesn't have a, a false premise to it it's really about intention and clearing the space uh and and setting setting the scene and allowing things to happen on the base of that so they've been a, they've been a huge influence on me i still love them i still absolutely love them do you still make them I do, but I'm, I'm nearly 52, and they're <laughs> physically really quite, you know. The people I know who made some of the, the, the enormous um, sort of Mandelbrot mandalas and things like that, they've all got terrible, what was called croppy's knee. They've all got terrible <laughs> rheumatoid arthritis in their knee, and they're, they're a bit like that, you know, that joke about the haggis being having one leg shorter than the other. They, always, they all go round in circles, so... Um, so I, 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 yeah, and also the, I don't feel that it's time. It's, it was a different age then, you know. Yeah. Agriculture was heavily subsidised. It just doesn't feel like it's crop circle making time now, really. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um, you talk about being in the crop circles, a sense of there being a temple, and and it being it became part of ritual for you. The traditional funeral industry is very, very much about ritual in a pomp and circumstance way. Now, I know that very unusually, you're a, you, you conduct most of the ceremonies in that you're the celebrant as well as the undertaker. Yes, yeah, as, and, you, and you are the celebrant as well, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, so how do you, bring, how do you bring ritual to the ceremonies that you, or how do you work with families to create rituals that are meaningful for them? Um, very carefully, because I think, uh, you know, when I, when I first, I've been doing this for 20, 23 years now, and when I first started it, the beginning of the kind of alternative funeral movement, um, s ceremonies could be very busy, uh, you know, and people would, f would go, okay, so we're not doing the church thing, we're not having prayers, we're not singing hymns, we're not doing that, there's no incense, so we've got to replace everything with, with a, a secular alternative. And there was a lot of, there was just too much going on. Uh, you know, there was, there was passing a talking stick around is a nightmare if you've got 150 people mm. and the talking stick gets to someone and you're like, oh no, they never, you know. <laughs> so so I start, they started off being a bit busy and they've just become slimmer and slimmer, as it were. Oh. Um, and, and again, it's almost like going from a, from a really complicated crop circle to a very simple circle. Mm. So the rituals that I kind of do are just trying to bring people into the moment very quickly. Okay. Um, not through, through maybe ringing a gong or doing anything like that, but just setting the tone uh, and letting people know that we are going to be talking about the person 
in a very honest way. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of snaps people, you know, people are, you, you, I'm sure you know what it's like, people are used to going to funerals where they talk in the back of the creme and they just, you know, they're having a bit of a laugh and they're waiting to get out. Yeah. And if you say something important straight away, people are like, oh God. Absolutely. Oh God. Where <laughs> so, so now my rituals are really just about sincerity, I suppose. Yeah. I think that's, that's figured really highly in my work is about the honesty. Yeah. Um, I saw somewhere in the book is about honesty, appreciation, and there was a third... Honesty, uh, participation, and... Oh, God, I forgot. Something. It's three, <laughs> transparency. Transparency yeah. is the other one. Uh, you say that to properly honour somebody, they need to be seen in their entirety, which is something I completely agree with. But... How does that work when that individual's entirety isn't palatable to society? Because not everybody is loved. Absolutely. So, so that's that's a red line for me. Is is the the the, the term loved one? Uh, because, as you say, not everybody is loved, and you just have to kind of go, oh, you know, um, are you going to come round to see your loved one to the wrong person? And they're like. I, I didn't love him. He was a, a you know a violent, abusive, alcoholic yeah. bastard. He, I don't love him. So it's but but everybody deserves a funeral. And I think that by the time you've died, really, what you are owed is the truth uh, yeah. about yourself. And it's very difficult because somebody else is going to be saying that truth um, about yourself. But it can be done in, and I'm and I'm sure you do it in exactly the same way, Sophie. There's there are ways that you can bring someone's faults and, and the, the tragedies in their life without bringing any judgment at all yeah. because you, you, it's very difficult to, to, to see a life until it's done. Yeah. And, you, you know, the day before somebody dies, it's, their story is still going on. But once yeah. they're dead, you suddenly see the arc of, 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 of the story and it always has a reason. Badness doesn't yeah. come out of nowhere stuff happens for a reason and once you've got that reason you can explain it it's a lot easier to deal with someone's unpalatable sides and we've all got unpalatable sides yeah, you know absolutely you just have to we, i'm sure you're the same we just get away from um from whitewashing people into you know yeah. it's part of that that's still a, a religious hangover that you that you can't speak ill of the dead or that somehow because then now they're dead they're up in a different place and they know more than you yeah. and they're better than you because they're yeah. dead. It's like, well, they're just, they were, they were just like us, you know, flawed human beings. Yeah, and, and there's, I, there's very much an element to, of performance in that celebrancy work. And actually the moment you stand up and start to describe somebody nobody in the audience would ever recognise in a million years, yes. um, it's gone. So that you've lost them. You've lost them. Fundamental, then, isn't Absolutely, it? you've lost them. Yeah. Um, and but if if you mention just a couple of adjectives, which everybody goes, oh my god, they actually know we're actually going to talk about him. Yeah. The mood changes and it and it's electrifying. Yeah. And if you then give people permission to to share and say their own stuff. Yeah. And it might take a while. It might take, a, you know, three quarters of an hour before someone actually kind of chimes in and goes, well, they were like this and that. It, it, it's, it's wonderful, isn't it? And it's, it never feels uh, like you're condemning anybody or judging yeah. anybody, no matter what they've done. And I'm sure you've done this. You know, we were talking in the green room. Yeah. We've, we've done funerals for, for people who've done terrible things. You know, life is really hard and, yeah. and complicated. But you can still honour them yeah. uh, with the truth and all that they were absolutely yeah. okay um so we've got some children i can hear some children which is fantastic because the society that we live in um we don't involve children in death so how do you include children how do you hold space for them and their grief in a world where we don't allow children we pr we try and protect children from grief i'll use the word protect yeah, for, yeah for, the, for the best reasons. I mean, you know, that's why I became an undertaker. Basically, my dad died when I was seven and I didn't go to the funeral. And my grandparents died within three months and I didn't go to their funeral. So uh, I, that is my, one of my core drivers is including children. Uh, and, you know, the, 
the, the thing about kids, as we all know, is that actually they're, they're way more resilient than we uh, give them judgment for. And it's the, it's the adults who have a lot of the baggage around it. Um, so, and I, I still get families who kind of go, oh, I'm not, I don't think we're going to bring so-and-so to, to granddad's funeral. It's like, did, did they love him? It's like, yeah, they, they really loved him. But, you know, it's like, okay, we'll bring him. Because they're probably not going to be as up, upset as you think. Um, and they are going to regret it in 20 years' time if they're not there. So I, I, the way I try and do it is um, I try and imagine it like, uh, like it's a blizzard, like it's a whiteout, and um, you put a flag in every 100 yards, a kind of big scarlet flag, and that's a, you know, so when they return to the memory of the funeral in 20, 30 years' time, you can take them back from bit to bit and you go, do you remember that bit when you were doing that bit? And you take photos of it and you get them involved. You know, it actually, for most kids, even if it's their, their parents, if they're young enough, a funeral is an exciting, it's just another experience. It's an exciting yeah, day. Absolutely. But they need stuff for the future because that's when they're going to be going through it. So you just, you get them to hold the coffin. Yeah. You get them to, to lower, you know, to do, to be involved in it, to, to talk, to to take photographs, to write on the coffin. I love that. Yeah. With cardboard, some of the best ones I've done. Cardboard coffin with a box of Sharpies on it is a thing of wonder. It is a thing of so. wonder, yes, absolutely. Uh, and quite often quite obscene if you get the right crowd as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably best it's going in the ground quite yes, soon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, right, okay. So um, there was a phrase in your book, accidentally occult. <laughs> um, can you tell us a bit more about the performance ritual that you developed? Uh, yes, yes, I did. Um, yeah, I wrote a performance ritual, which I, I still do, and I'm not even entirely sure what it's about. It's meant to... It, it's, it has lines in it like, um, the glass of life is, is not half full or half empty, uh, it's already smashed on the floor and every drop that passes your lips is sucked from the teeth of non-existence. So it's just getting you into this idea that really, <laughs> that really, you know, um, we are already dead. There's a song by an amazing um, uh, band called Akron Family called uh, Don't Be Afraid, You're Already Dead. Um, and that's kind of one of the, ref the refrains in it. And it's quite... Um, it possibly should have a trigger warning. It makes people feel quite uh, uneasy. But it's also about upsetting, it, turning around the idea of, of, of ancestors yeah. and how we deal with ancestors. And again, it's getting back to that point of, um, uh, of if we imbuing our, our dead with a lot more wisdom. And it's very difficult to get away from that, of going, oh, they, they can see everything now. They know everything now. They know more yeah. than us. They're better than us. And it's yeah. part of that thing of going, oh, generations before were so much purer, you know. There was so Everything was better in the past. And part of this ritual is, is about trying to go, you're already dead, so what does it matter? You know, every, every moment that you are living is, is snatched. It's a miracle that we're here. The chances of us being here are just so unbelievable that how can you not just triumph but it's also about going what if we are really the ancestors because we are probably you know I, I believe that every generation becomes a little bit better just because um, people do you know we learn from the mistakes of the previous generation so it's it's a weird thing uh, it's a weird thing and it also involves a, a, a plastic skull which is a embodiment of a Haitian voodoo um, uh, right. deity called Papa Gede, <laughs> uh, who is the, the, the guardian of the graveyard in, in Haitian voodoo uh, um, cosmology, I suppose. He is the, the corpse of the first man to die. Mm. And he, has, he wears glasses with one lens removed so he can see into the, the underworld. Uh, and he's like a lot of the, the voodoo, um, voodoo kind of gods. He's, he's quite crude and sexual and, and uh, um, iris, uh, deeply disrespectful to authority. Uh, so it involves him and he's got a cigar and I put him on a, used to put him on a turntable and light it and 
pour him libations of rum and stuff like that. But it's just a kind of, um, and it's also about trying to get people to realize that your ancestors are not your genetic, not just your genetic ancestors, they're your cultural ancestors. Yeah. And that probably your cultural ancestors are still alive. Yeah. And that it's really good to, uh, to recognize them and realize where you're coming from. So that's what that's about. But it still makes me go, I don't, I don't know really what it's about, you know. <laughs> Accidentally occult, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't think you necessarily have to know what you're doing when you start out. Yeah. You can uh, retrospectively explain yourself. That's quite <laughs> you useful. You can add meaning as you go along. You can, yeah. Marvellous. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I gather that you're also involved in, uh, with Bill Drummond and Jimmy Corty. So they're from, you might know them as the KLF, amongst their many, many other talents. Um, What's the People's Pyramid? Oh, the People's Pyramid. So um, I got to know. Uh, I'm a huge. I'm a, I was a huge fan of the KLF. Um, they're, they're most. They're, they're, they're actually the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo is who they are beyond the KLF. But they're kind of probably most famous for uh, at the height of their success in 1992 when they were the biggest selling singles band in the world. They uh, deleted their entire back catalogue, um, left the music industry, uh, and took the remaining money that they had, which was a million quid, and burnt it. Um, and then started a kind of a very peripatetic career as, as a conceptual artist, which some of it is great, some of it is a bit bonkers. Yeah. Um, but I met Jimmy Corty when uh, I bought one of his installations, one of his dystopian uh, model villages which if you ever get a chance to see them do they're really great yeah. haunting uh, I brought it down to Totnes and I got to know him then and then his family come from Totnes uh, and very sadly about three months after that his brother uh, took his own life right. so uh, um, we did the funeral for that and um, they've always had an obsession with pyramids uh, and we were going to burn Jimmy's brother on a pyre uh, but his, uh, he's got, his, his brother had four sons and they thought that was a little full on, which right. is fair enough. Yep. So um, a couple of months after the funeral, Jimmy rang me up and he went, we've had an idea. And the idea is basically that you get, um, you, it's called mummification. Uh, you, you can buy a house brick and in the middle of it, it's got a, an indentation about a thumb, thumb deep. Uh, and... When, you're, when you die, if you're cremated, uh, 23 grams of your cremated bones are sprinkled into the hole, taken back to the brick factory and refired. And that means that the, the, the ashes, which are basically bones, human bones, forms a kind of beautiful glaze, like a kind of pottery glaze. Uh, and once a year, we get together the bricks that have been mummified uh, and we're assembling them into a pyramid, and it's uh, in Toxteth. We haven't. Qu we're very, very close to finding a site in Toxteth. But Liverpool is um, is an amazing place, and is very important to, to both Bill and Jimmy. Um, so the idea behind it, and we also created the Toxteth Day of the Dead around it, which is uh, um, the Liverpool Arts Lab have created a, a, a marvelous. Uh, series of rituals about it but but what it's about is um it's trying to create a a communal mourning uh focus that has no no props around it it's not so it's not about the klf it's not about bill and jimmy or any of the thing they've done it's not about any religion it's about having this thing which we all come together uh and and turns into a, a kind of um I mean, it's not for everyone because basically you're in a brick, in a pyramid. It's going to be 23 foot high. It's going to take 63,549 bricks to make. Wow. Uh, so I'm going to be long dead by the time it's done. Yeah. And, and it will be semi-anonymous, though there's a lot of um, really interesting tech that we're going to do. There's going to be a 3D model of it so that you can zoom in on your particular relative's brick and pull out all the information and there'll be all their kind of life, life story there. But it's, Fantastic. Um, it, it's, it's, it's been going a few years now and it's quite incredible to see this community that's, that's built up around it. So once a year it happens and they bring their bricks and we cement it 
and it, the, the architect has designed it so that it's always a, a pyramid. It's like a growing crystal. Um, and just to see people who've got no idea who the KNF are, don't, don't give a toss about that. They're, they're just they're having a go at a second funeral and they're doing it with other people who are complete strangers yeah. and they're cementing these bricks into a pyramid and then afterwards we have a party and you see them talking to each other and you see them having this, this opportunity to, to talk about the person they love who has died with someone else who's a complete stranger with nothing in common apart from that they're all going into the pyramid. Um, it's a great thing. It's a really great thing. We weren't sure if it was going to work, but I really know it's going to work now. I absolutely love the, the aspiration and the thought that people can come and bring their dead, talk about the person who's died, because there seems to be a cliff after the funeral. Oh, God. And nobody yeah. knows what to say and what to do. And to create that focal point where you're there, but the dead person's there with you. Yes. Not in any spiritual way, but just yeah. acknowledging who, who they were and Absolutely. what they brought. Yeah. Sounds it's, immensely it, valuable for the people that, it, that participate. It, 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 immensely valuable. I mean, I, th I think a kind of comparable thing would be the COVID memorial wall that started in Westminster. Yeah. But that obviously uh, has a, 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 a quite a justifiable undercurrent of anger and is a very specific thing. But at last year's... Um, uh, which we, we, we did up in um, Buxton, just to confuse people, the Toxted Day of the Dead up in Buxton. Um, but there was a, a, a woman and her mum came along and they had the ashes of their son who had died probably six or seven years before. And he'd, he'd, he'd had a slightly troubled life. He'd, he'd struggled with alcohol and substance abuse. And, it, you know, he died young and it was a sad thing. Uh, and they came up, and this was, you know, quite out of their kind of cultural framework, doing something like this. And they laid the brick, and it was, a, you know, when everyone comes forward, we call the names out. And when they come forward one at a time, it's an incredible moment. There's about two, three hundred people around it, and they come forward crying with their brick. And we literally cement it in place, and mm. we've, got a, we've got a brick layer who's really good at doing it. And then we went back to, the, to a hotel for a party afterwards. And... Um, Everyone was allowed to bring three uh, tracks. So, so there's a massive playlist. And the, the mum, who is probably about, uh, I don't know, about 65, 66, started, started dancing. And, and I could see that the way she was dancing, that she was no stranger to, to <laughs> dancing. And I was like, you've done that before, haven't you? you know, she, was, she was just settling in for a proper, proper skank, proper rave. Uh, and she said... I haven't danced a, a step since my son died. And just to suddenly go, wow, he, this has freed something enough that you're dancing yeah. and you're dancing with someone else who, who's laid a brick today and you're just telling them about your son and they're telling them about their dad. It was just an incredible thing to go, we could, we could just step back now completely. We, it yeah. doesn't need to have any, it's, it's going, you yeah. know, it's going. It sounds absolutely fantastic. And actually, I've never wanted to be cremated, but do you need whole, whole body ashes? Well, if, if I have to have a bit lopped off, do you could know I have what, that Do you know cremated? what? This is, this, is, this is a question which comes up a lot. Um, really? <laughs> it, it really is. It really is. It, I might, we might even have to put it on the terms and conditions. <laughs> it's like... Uh, um, no, you don't have to be totally cremated. Uh, you have to have a very understanding funeral director. <laughs> um, I can recommend one. <laughs> um, and I don't know, I haven't yet worked out how much of, a, of how many bones you need to fit into the... <laughs> I mean, I d the first time I was asked this, I was like, yeah, probably an arm would be fine. But um, uh, I'm thinking probably a hand would be enough. Okay. Uh, and, and somehow it's got to be reduced to bone. And you can't put a hand in a cremator. It'll just probably go. So this is quite a lot of practical issues around it. You probably need a pestle and mortar and a barbecue. Uh, <laughs> You know, there's, I think that I think that's legal. Um. <laughs> no words. Um, <laughs> so, 
there is so much more that we could have talked about, Rue. I just... Um, and it's an absolute privilege to hear what you've shared. Tell us just, when does your book, have you got your book? When's your book I have come got my out? Book. I have got my book. It's called What Remains. It's out in September. Um, as some wag has pointed out, it, uh, What Remains sounds a little bit like someone turning up and going, where's my dad's ashes? <laughs> and I was going, I thought you had them. What Remains? Um, uh, it's, yeah, it's coming out in September, uh, published by Chelsea Green. Um, and what, sorry, what was the question? So we, 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 I was uh, just letting you plug in. Oh, you let me it's plug all good. in. Thank you. It's all good. Thank I you. was lucky enough it's, to have a um, proof copy, and it's really good. It's well, really very good. It's, um, it's quite raw, I think. Uh, yeah. I do like to take... Um, I don't know if I'm going to get an opportunity to write another book, so I've taken a right old pop at things that I don't like, uh, and I've taken a right old hurrah of things I do approve of. Um, and I feel, uh, coming, coming here this weekend, I had no idea what to expect. And um, I'm, I find it deeply inspiring and deeply hopeful that you just go, oh, wow, there are pockets of culture which are thriving, really. And, and I suppose what I wanted to do in the book was just go, these are the things I think are great. These are the things I think are shit. Yeah. And I think it's all right to, to say that at this stage of the game, really. Yeah. And hopefully it'll inspire others the same way that you were inspired to take a completely different approach. So there is only one question I can end on. Okay. You know what I'm going to ask you. Oh, no. Like me. Yes. You absolutely recommend that families don't leave, that individuals don't leave deeply specific information on what they want to happen at their funeral because funerals are for those who are left behind. Um, and it can just add stress. However, what are your hopes for your own well, funeral? Yeah. Well, yes, I agree. I, I always tell people not to overplan their own funeral, but of course, I make an exception for myself. <laughs> um, it's changing a little bit now as I grow up a bit. Uh, actually, it, what what I always what I do want in, a, in an ideal scenario, I'd like to be cremated on a pyre, um, and that. I was involved in a campaign to find out whether that was legal, and I think we've kind of clarified that it is pretty much semi, semi legal. But I don't think that you're going to be prosecuted for it if you've done all the right paperwork. Put it that way. If you've murdered someone and you then burn them on a funeral pyre, you're yeah, in. don't do that. That's a different thing. But it, it, in an ideal scenario, it would be midsummer. Um, it would be on top of a hill. Uh, my friends and family would carry me up to an enormous pyre. Um, and as dusk fell, it would be lit uh, and um, it would be fed with wood all night long. Uh, and then come dawn, it would be kind of, and everyone would dance around it and, you know, have a rave around it, basically. Um, but as I get older, I'm starting to realise that that's a big ask of, um, of, my, of my, my, my family and my partner. And I don't, so I don't necessarily think that it's fair to say to, to, to the people who love me that they have to do that. And your friends with crop circle knees, the dancing all night's going to oh, be tricks. Oh, God, yeah. Well, no, it's, it's, it's all right because it's in a circle. Oh, OK. <laughs> they're fine, they're fine. You just, you just set them off. They're like donkeys. You just... Uh... <laughs> Rue, that's brilliant. Can you please join me in thanking Rue Callender? Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Brilliant.